Thank you, Clayson. Good morning, everyone. Um, if you just joined us for this session, welcome. We are going to continue with our program. Um, and this session in the late morning is we have two uh, guest speakers that will be presenting their uh, talks to us live. This is um, Leonard Shapiro from University uh, of Cape Town and Dr. Ian Keenan from the UK. Now, both these um, um, speakers or our guest speakers specializes or has an interest in, um, in anatomy and education. Um, and they make use of three, three dimensional visualizations and ask based learning approaches in anatomy. And it's interesting, um, we will see how um, they will demonstrate to us how this can improve students' uh, three-dimensional observation ability and spatial awareness. Right, with further ado, I'm going to introduce, ask Dr, uh, sorry, uh, ask Leonard Shapiro to please start with his presentation. And then straight after that, Dr. Ian Keenan will give his presentation. And then we will um, handle all the questions during the question session at 11.45. Thank you. Thanks, Liana, very much. Um, just to let you know, my background actually is in, uh, in art, fine art. And, um, and I teach in um, human biology. I teach a very specific method of observation using touch and drawing, and I also design um, uh, exercises to help improve three-dimensional spatial awareness. Um, I just want to say a question. Someone's got a mic on. Uh, so before I start, I just want to plant a seed in your mind before I share my screen. Uh, if you can see me here looking at this hammer, when I move my hand around it, when I use touch uh, to feel it, I'm actually making gestures that flow over it, okay? And when I talk about um, using uh, appropriate, uh, an appropriate drawing method, I'm talking about making similar gestures to the, which I make with my hand touching, or even if we use this plastic humerus, touching this, exploring it haptically, then we translate that into marks on paper. So I'll share my screen now with you. Uh, let's just go to there. Okay, I'm just going to go to present a view so I can see what's going on. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the most effective combination of drawing approaches uh, for observation and understanding of three-dimensional anatomy. So what I'll be presenting you with is I'm going to talk about why we use touch and drawing for improved observation of 3D anatomy. I'm going to address what is drawing anyway, and I'll address some myths and conceptions, uh, some of the different types of drawing approaches or drawing styles. I'll show you those to you. Uh, why we use a specific combination of two drawing approaches in 3D anatomy education. I will go through that. I'll talk about the haptico visual observation and drawing method, which is a method of observation which uses touch and sight and mark making or drawing. We'll see some examples of University of Cape Town medical students drawings while observing using the uh, observation method that I've just mentioned. Uh, we'll talk about the benefits of using haptico visual observation and drawing. And we'll have thoughts, questions and discussions obviously after my colleague, Dr. Ian Keenan has spoken. So why use touch to observe? So we all know the homunculus uh, and the relatively large amount of afferent nerves that go from the hand to the sensory cortex of the brain. 
So we know about that. So it stands to some reason uh, to use touch as an observation modality, aside from using our eyes. Then coupled with this are these exploratory procedures that um, the professors uh, Roberta Klatsky and uh, Susan Lederman identified and classified as far back as 1987, and they've been doing research into haptics for many, many years. So we have lateral motion, uh, we have globe or global shape or enclosure, uh, we have contour following. And remember, I was showing you some movements I was making on the surface of that hammer and the surface of the plastic humerus. Well, these are the kind of um, uh, movements that we actually make all the time in our daily lives. We make these movements unconsciously, but for uh, observation using touch, we're going to actively apply these, some of these um, uh, uh, exploratory procedures. We're going to actively apply specifically like contra following and, and enclosure and lateral motion, okay? Just to show you what the kind of drawing looks like that comes out using this observation method. And remember, it's primarily observation that we're trying to achieve here. We're not making artworks. We're trying to achieve observation, deeper observation of the form of the anatomy. So you can see in this picture that the student is touching with her finger. She's been using her finger to move over the surface of this object, this hammer, this three-dimensional object, and she is translating those movements that she's making with her hand onto paper with marks, with some graphite to make marks. So she's active touch with the one hand. She's using active touch. She's engaging the exploratory procedures. That is a gestural activity. And with the other hand, she's making gestural marks on paper. And when we, so she's using actually cross contour and gesture marks to describe the three dimensional form, but we'll get to what cross contour marks are in a minute. So, in essence, touch is a sensory gesture using the exploratory procedures that we have um, been, uh, uh, that we saw. Drawing is a motor gesture, okay? So we've got the sensory gesture and the motor gesture, and that is drawing or making marks on paper. So we explore with a sense of touch. Uh, we feel the object, that's a manual gestural activity. We reflect what is felt by drawing it on paper. That's also a manual gestural activity. I'm just repeating for the sake of um, explanation. We explore an object with one hand using exploratory procedures. And with the other hand, we make corresponding gestures with a pencil in order to reflect and record these exploratory procedures on paper. Okay. Uh, here we are looking at, uh, for example, we all understand this uh, image, this uh, image of a contour map which has cross contour lines around it. That describes three-dimensional form. In, in drawing, we have what's called cross contour drawing, which also makes use of these cross contour lines, okay? And then we have something called gesture drawing. Now that uh, is actually a, a hand, a sort of a fist that has been drawn really quickly. So in the same way that you move your hand over the object really quickly, or not quickly, um, at a haphazard way, you make marks as well. So the combination of cross contour and gesture drawing is what we're going to use. Before we go to see some of these images, I want to just clear up the misconceptions about drawing, because a lot of people think I can't draw, but actually everyone does draw. Everyone can write. Everyone can make marks on the back of envelopes when you thinking and trying to describe things to people. Clinicians make um, notes and show, you know, uh, make drawing notes and show them to patients by way of explanation. So we all draw. Um, and I just want to read you this quote from <clears throat> Professor uh, Dowd, who's at the Art and American Culture, Professor of Art and American Culture Studies at Washington University. Uh, 
He wrote a book, an amazing book called Stick Figures, Drawing as a Human Practice. And um, he says, all human markings are descendants of primordial drawings in dirt. The symbolic projection of human mentality began with a finger in the sand and then a stick in the clay. From that stick came the calligrapher's brush, the pecker's rock. From the very beginning, human thought has been built with lines on surface. So we, humankind has been making marks, scratching in rocks, etc., making drawing in the sand to describe things well before uh, land, well before uh, writing was invented, well before that. So drawing is far more fundamental to us than writing, for example. Another quote from Clive Ashwin uh, from one of his papers, drawing, he talks about drawing as a system of signs, as important cultural origins. So in German, Zeichnen means sign, which gives Zeichnen Zeichnen for the verb to draw, which is to make signs. And in English, we have drawing, which takes its form from the action of pulling, which is characteristic of so much drawing activity. Okay, so that just dispels, I hope I've dispelled some myths about that when people say, I can't draw. And as you'll see, when I show you the pictures of students, second year medical students, their drawings, you'll see that indeed they can draw. People can draw who have no drawing experience. So drawing is actually an umbrella term. And we have a number of different drawing styles, which are in art, the art world called drawing approaches. Okay, We have hyper-realistic drawing. We have shading from light to dark. We have cross-hatching. We have contour drawing. We have cross-contour drawing and we have gesture drawing. And now I'll illustrate those to you. The drawing, on the, the drawing of the man is sort of shading from light to dark. The drawing of the woman is, um, is, is, is a hyper-realistic drawing, okay? So this is not the drawing approach we want to use because it does not approximate the a kind of hand gestures that I was talking about, okay? This is cross-hatching. It's another drawing approach, another drawing style where you use um, straight lines at uh, right angles to each other to build up um, a sort of shape, okay? But again, this does not give us what we want to do because we're primarily observing, okay? And we want to use touch and drawing to observe with, okay? This is called contour drawing where it's pretty much just the uh, line, a single line or singular lines that are outlining an object. Now we get close to the kind of drawing marks that we want to be making. And this is uh, a drawing by a famous artist, a sculptor actually called Henry Moore. And you can see the marks that he makes uh, uh, are contra, cross contour lines that he uses to describe shape to describe three-dimensional form. This um, wireframe um, of this hammer is showing cross contours, which also describe form, okay? So conceptually, they are the same. The one is a famous artwork, the one is, you know, uh, taken off the internet. This is gesture drawing. So this is an artist called Alberto Giacometti, another famous artist. He's no longer with us, but he um, uses gesture. So he's using very quick, um, haphazard lines. So what we want, okay, is to take gesture drawing, okay, on the, on the left, plus cross contour drawing equals, well, I don't have a name for that kind of drawing. It's a combination of cross contour and gesture drawing. And you can see, how this hammer, the form of the hammer, the shape, its, its positioning in space is very well described. If you look and analyze each mark, as I'll show you again, these marks 
have a semiotic value. Okay, they have a value. They describe the form and the structure. The point again, I must emphasize, is that when uh, when one feels the hammer with one hand and draws it with the other hand, primarily what's taking place is observation and memorization. So just to uh, summarize that, we are using cross contour and gesture drawing in combination, and that is best suited as a drawing approach for observing the three-dimensional form of objects uh, and anatomical parts, of course. Uh, using the haptico-visual observation and drawing method. Uh, we are trying to observe and understand three-dimensional form. So we are not making art. We are employing an art-based technique that is integrated and suited to an observation method using the sense of touch. Of course, we use sight as well. Our primary aim is observation, and the drawing records what we observe and also assists in the observation process. So here we have a class from the University of Cape Town in an anatomy observation and drawing special studies module. Uh, and they busy drawing. Uh, so let's look at this drawing that was done by one of those students. The drawing itself, even though it looks very crude, if you look at the lines, these lines are showing where the person, where the student has touched the object and, and, um, um, and has recorded it on paper. So actually, if you look at this drawing, it's showing multiple perspectives of this one object. Here is, is shown this part. Uh, here, that line is referring to, to that part, you see. Uh, those lines refer to that part. So, What's happening here is what's happening is again observation. Let's look at that drawing that the second year student has done with no art training, and the drawing on the left, which is a drawing by a really famous artist whose name is Frank Auerbach, is one of Britain's most celebrated artists. And you can see again with his drawing, there's a semiotics. There's a the draw the marks have a descriptive value. We can even say we can look and see that this kind of approximates the zygomatic arch, right? So Frank Arbach is not drawing just the surface of the skin of the face. He's actually going beneath the soft tissue to what's underneath. He's very cognizant of the fact that he's drawing a head. He's not just drawing a portrait. So all of these marks have a value. They have a descriptive value. And similarly, what looks like a crude drawing is, in, in, in my view, as an artist, a really, really good drawing. Here is a drawing by a, 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 um, a, a pediatric surgeon from uh, Red Cross Children's Memorial Hospital. She was doing a, a, a CPD course with me. I was teaching this to a number of registrars and look at the marks that she's making while she's exploring this um, humerus. Remember that all the cadaveric material in this presentation are from the teaching collection uh, from the University of Cape Town. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me just go back. What I'm going to show you now is a little video. It's only one minute something, but it's all, it was made by a student and um, it, um, it was made by student La uh, Leila Muhammad, and it shows it's a group exercise. So remember, these students have been uh, drawing or observing and drawing the humerus a number of times, so they're quite good at it. So everyone is going to take a turn to draw on one piece of paper, uh, and they're using about 15 seconds each. Okay, here we go. Okay. Right, so let's go. I just want to say, watch their hands. Watch the hand holding the humerus and the hand drawing, and you'll see how they are feeling. They are using touch to observe the humerus. Thank you. 
So just keep watching a few more seconds. Okay. Oh, there we go. So it's a, it was obviously a, that's a group exercise. All right. Just wanted to show you what it looks like when we draw using haptico visual observation plus drawing. Um, sorry, I should have said what it looks like when we observe using haptico visual observation and drawing. If we look at this, uh, this drawing is a focus on the um, mandibular condyle. You can see that the photograph, okay, there's the photograph of the uh, mandibular condyle and the, and the mandible, uh, but um, if you look at the drawing, the drawing, I believe, shows more in terms of the marks. It describes the form much more, much better, which is why we have botanical artists who paint and draw a flower in order to accentuate certain features. Uh, you know that if you look at uh, like Veneta and, um, and Carlos Machado's drawings and, and illustrations rather, these illustrations are there because if you so to accentuate and show different anatomical structures. So, um, um, okay, so I think that, yeah, that's the, the point I wanted to make. Um, and yeah, that point I wanted to make is if you have a photograph, say, of uh, the upper limb, uh, a prosection of the upper limb, um, and you just have a photograph, what are you gonna say? Do you, will you learn more from the photograph or learn more from the illustration? Well, of course, both are good. And that's why uh, dissection is good, prosections are good, and, and drawing them is very good, okay? Just again, the, to show you the marks that people make, these are marks from two different people, uh, um, drawings from two different people, but just look at this drawing here on the right, where you can see that the person has used the graphite um, to, in fact, we use graphite like this, a short piece like this, if you can see in the pic, what I'm showing you now, but they've used pressure over there to, to they've actually applied man, they've applied uh, pressure manually. They've, they've used, the motor function to, to really define this shape. This again is a, a prosection that a student uh, did, drawing of a prosection, observation and drawing of it. Uh, look at the, I mean, it is beautiful. It's, um, it's a beautiful drawing. So the benefits of observing using haptico-visual observation and drawing. It's the enhanced observation of a three-dimensional form of anatomical parts, the cognitive memorization of an anatomical parts as a 3D mental picture, uh, a mental picture that can be drawn upon, that you know, a person can look at, um, rotate in their head. And as you know, spatial awareness is essential, especially in anat anatomy studies and clinical practice. The improved uh, three-dimensional spatial awareness and ability to orient 
uh, orientate within the volume of anatomical parts and of course, an ability to draw. This uh, is uh, showing uh, the um, observation of the orbit and the zygomatic arch primarily, and you can see the, the drawing on the left and just compare them, have a look at the close relationship between them. This is a, a, another group of students at UCT, uh, and this drawing is by the person in the uh, maroon shirt. He was drawing the teaching skeleton and those parts of it. So each person has a drawing, their own unique drawing um, signature or drawing style. Uh, let's see how we're we doing for time. Um, 22 minutes. Okay, so uh, the, myself and Dr. Ian Keenan, who will be speaking to us next, um, are both of our universities, the University of Cape Town and Newcastle University, are collaborating together on the making of an online course, which is all about helping students to improve their three-dimensional awareness. And Ian and I have designed a number of exercises uh, that help students with this. It's an online course. Um, it has been piloted at Newcastle University. It's currently being piloted at the University of Cape Town. And the intention is for this course to go global, potentially be translated into Kosa, Afrikaans, um, Arabic, uh, Korean, whatever the need is. And that is, you know, it's taken us, oh goodness, I think Ian will correct me, but could be over a year to do, to, to make. And it's been incredibly fun making. And our thanks to our respective universities for supporting us in this. Some of our papers um, on uh, three-dimensional spatial awareness. Uh, this one actually written with myself, Ian, and Prof Lowe. This one over here, how haptics uh, enhance and drawing enhance the learning of anatomy. Also written uh, together with Prof Lowe and Stephen Reed from our university in Cape Town. Uh, this one, remember, Rudolf spoke to us yesterday about um, uh, 3D printing and spatial awareness and surgery. So this was the chapter that I wrote with him, myself, Toby Branson from Adelaide University, uh, actually called the University of Adelaide and, and Rudolf from Stellenbosch University. Uh, this is Ian Keenan's paper with Megan Powell on interdimensional travel, visualization of 3D to 2D transitions and anatomy learning. So there's a lot that's being written about to do with touch, to do with space, three-dimensional space. And this paper, oh, this paper here, I love, made by Madeline Keener and Richard Lowe, seeing with the hands and with the eyes, the contributions of haptic cues to anatomical shape recognition in surgery. It is an incredible paper, absolutely incredible. It reads beautifully and I would really encourage anyone who's interested to read it. So acknowledgement and thanks. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, the University of Cape Town medical students and healthcare professionals contributing their, for contributing their drawings. University of Western Cape Local Organizing Committee. Thank you very much. The Anatomical Association. Oh, it should be the Anatomical. Yes, it is the Anatomical Association of South Africa, I think. The colleagues in the, in the, at the UCT Department of Human Biology. I want to acknowledge Dr. Ian Keenan, Newcastle University School of Medicine for our continued and fruitful research and collaboration. And uh, we acknowledge with gratitude the contribution of body donors to the UCT Division of Clinical Anatomy, Anatomy and Biological Anthropology. And finally, just to end on a, a picture that was taken by a student <laughs> and uh, please do follow me on Twitter if you want to. That's my uh, Twitter handle, Leonard underscore Shapira. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And thank you very, very much for your time and for listening. And thank you, Liana.
And thank you, Liana. Thank you, Leonard. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your talk. There is two questions, but I think we'll just carry on with Dr. Ian Keenan's uh, presentation before we actually get back to the questions. Dr. Keenan. Thanks. I uh, hope you can all see uh, my slides okay. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for the invitation uh, to the organizers and thanks, Leonard. Um, for that interesting talk. I'm just gonna expand on, on some of what Leonard's been talking about there in terms of some of the, the research that we've been doing on uh, the approaches that Leonard's been mentioning. So the, the haptical visual observation and drawing, but also a, a new process that Leonard's developed that we're calling haptic surface painting. Um, so this is the Newcastle campus here, uh, which looks very nice uh, as it is in, in the springtime at the moment. Um, so I teach uh, anatomy at uh, the medical school at, at Newcastle, uh, and I also have research interests, as Leonard said, in, in sort of art-based uh, learning and also in uh, 3D digital visualisation. Uh, and obviously I'm going to sort of talk a bit about both of those things today. Um, so this is what we do at Newcastle. We teach anatomy for various different programmes. Uh, we've currently running a, a blended curriculum, which uh, involves a lot of in-person practical teaching, but we also have a lot of uh, remote teaching as well, particularly uh, a lot of pre preparatory work that the students do on uh, VLE tutorials before they actually come into the dissecting room. Um, so we have cadaveric material, we have prosections uh, from our body donors. Uh, we also use commercial models, we use 3D printed models, we use various different uh, 3D visualization technologies, including a, a sector visualization table. Uh, and we have uh, remote applications to go with that. Uh, so sector remote uh, applications and also complete anatomy. Uh, and we do use, uh, it's not just myself at Newcastle, some of my colleagues as well use various different art-based learning approaches as well. Um, so, this is kind of our aims at Newcastle and my aims uh, in my research with Leonard is that we re we're really interested in having students work with us on our research. It's really valuable to have their input on our research, but also it's really valuable for them in terms of the, the transferable skills that they can develop. And so what we like to do is we want to generate research led evidence based approaches to anatomy learning. So we try and, uh, as best we can, uh, evaluate or perform research on various different uh, approaches that we use in our curriculum, because we want to find out what works the best for our students. And obviously with, with COVID, we've had to adapt some of our approaches, introduce uh, some new approaches. And our curriculum over the last four years, it's been different every year in the way that we've delivered it. Um, and so obviously going forward next year, it'll probably be different again. So we've got to think about how we're going to adapt uh, how we do things. Uh, and as Leonard mentioned, these are some of our publications uh, looking at art based uh, learning in terms of observation and visualization. Um, <clears throat> so we've one that uh, I don't think Leonard mentioned was our 12 tips paper for art based uh, learning, although that's sort of five years old now. Uh, you might find that useful if you do have any interest in, uh, in using art based approaches. Uh, and we do have other um, papers as well that you might want to read. Uh, I'm going to focus in a moment on this paper that again that Leonard mentioned. Uh, which is about haptical visual observation and drawing. Uh, and we're in the process of writing up another paper about the, the haptic surface painting as well. Um, so as Leonard has said, I'm not going to go into any details about the, the process of HVOD, because uh, Leonard's already done that. But you can see here again the, the hammer as an example. And this is actually my own drawing here of, of a humerus, um, <clears throat> which again, as Leonard was saying, I mean, it looks nice. It's visually appealing. Um, kind of looks a bit like a humerus, I hope. Um, but the most important thing was while I was doing that process, I was actually using haptical visual observation and to get a, a better spatial understanding of the humerus. And having done that process, I, I myself know that I, I do understand, uh, you know, the spatial arrangement of the humerus a lot better. 
So we, we did a focus group. We, we did uh, actually a workshop at Newcastle. This is, this is going back uh, five years now. Uh, we did a, a workshop at Newcastle for, for educators from around the UK who came to us and we, Leonard did a workshop and then we did a focus group after that. Uh, and this is what we've uh, published in our paper along with a, a full description of HVOD for anybody who'd like to, to try it out themselves. Uh, so from, from this focus group with educators, we came up with these three themes. So obviously, as we've been saying, the, the spatial exploration, the holistic understanding of anatomy is something that you can really gain from using this, uh, this focused observation. Um, we also did identify that there are certain um, requirements, uh, certain modifications that we need to do if we're going to actually embed this within our curriculum. Because at, at Newcastle, we've got a very sort of packed curriculum. Um, you know, the timetable has got a lot in it. So actually fitting something like HVOD into the timetable, and it can be quite a, you know, a time consuming process. Um, we wanted to try and find a way that we could integrate it successfully into our curriculum. And that's where the, the MOOC comes in that Leonard just mentioned. And I'll come back to that later on. Um, and one thing that we've, we found and something that we want to recreate in the MOOC is this engagement in a social environment. Obviously, in person, you get that, that social um, interaction, uh, but it's not necessarily as easy in a, in a sort of a, a MOOC format. So we've tried to include as many sort of discussion boards as we can in the MOOC to try and uh, facilitate this, this uh, engagement between participants. So that's HVOD. I want to move on now and talk a bit about HSP. So this is haptic surface painting. Um, and this is a similar process. It involves some of the similar uh, sort of uh, cognitive um, processes. It involves observation. It involves uh, visual and haptic observation. And it also involves actually uh, producing a representation of those observations. Okay, but rather than it being on paper, we're actually doing it on the skin. Um, so it's Leonard who actually runs these workshops and well, essentially Leonard knows more about the, the process itself than I do. So if you've got any specific questions about that, then I'm sure Leonard will be able to answer those for you. But I just wanted to say, obviously, from that description, what I'm saying there, you're painting onto the surface of the skin. This process probably, for those of you who have done or have read about uh, body painting in anatomy, um, it probably sounds quite a familiar description. OK, but I just wanted to emphasize that there is actually a difference between the classical body painting and uh, HSP. OK, so in classical body painting, what the, the intention is to identify surface reflection. So this is sort of uh, to provide clinical relevance in terms of clinical examinations to provide the students with an understanding of how to identify surface landmarks and what the underlying structures um, appear as surface reflections based on those landmarks. OK, so it does involve palpation because you've got to identify those surface landmarks. But what you then have to do when you're actually painting the surface reflection is you have to visualize what the 3D structure is going to look like underneath. OK, but by actually performing that, that um, palpation, by performing that body painting, you don't actually get to see or you don't actually get to palpate the 3D arrangement of the underlying structures. That's got to come from somewhere else. It's either got to come from prior knowledge or it's got to come from perhaps you have a model or you have um, a specimen uh, with you at that time. And that it's only having that other resource that's going to enable you to sort of visualize the 3D arrangement of what you can actually palpate. OK, the output is that you get this visual representation. You get a 2D image of a surface reflection on the skin. OK. So no doubt that is useful. There's been several studies um, describing body painting and its uses. It's obviously it's very engaging for the students. And again, it's useful for identifying uh, surface landmarks that are clinically relevant. OK, but HSP is slightly different because it has a different aim to start with. So we're not looking for surface reflections. We're actually trying to understand the 3D arrangement of the structures that we can palpate. 
Okay, if that makes sense. So there is a, it's a quite nuanced, but there is a distinction there between the two processes. Okay, so what we're doing here is we are visualizing, say, the upper limb. Okay, uh, so that could be, again, visual observation, but also haptic observation. So being able to palpate uh, tendons, blood vessels, bones, muscles, etc. Okay, so there are all of these, the 3D arrangements of these structures, how they relate to each other can actually be uh, palpated uh, and the ones that can't be visualized. Uh, and so what we end up with is we get a visual representation of the 3D arrangement of these observed structures. Okay, so again, it is different to the traditional body painting. Okay, so this is just to show you a bit about how this works. Um, so Leonard actually did some uh, workshops. This, the, these were via Zoom and these were with Newcastle students. These were, were last summer. Uh, so that was with seven students. So there were two workshops, uh, seven students all together and using food coloring. Uh, and using these uh, these sort of water brushes, but um, I think normal paint brushes would would work as well for it. Uh, and you can see the the students just kind of warmed up, uh, and this is a similar process in HVOD to to sort of warm up as well and to uh, sort of practice uh, the painting exercises. So that's just what what's shown here in these two images. Okay, so this these are just some examples of what the uh, this uh, haptic surface painting actually looks like here. Um, so you can see these are all, uh, they're not um, sort of representations of prior knowledge, prior understanding of the students. These representations are all from what they can actually either see and or palpate. Okay, so you can see there's some muscles on there. You can see tendons, blood vessels. Okay, um, and even some bony landmarks as well on there. Okay, so all structures that have been identified by palpation or by a combination of haptical, haptical, uh, haptic and visual observation. Okay, so uh, after the workshop, we did a focus group. Um, and again, it was the same students who did the workshop uh, who participated in the focus group. Uh, we analyzed those transcripts and we've come up with some themes uh, via thematic analysis. So these were, were the themes that we've identified. Okay, um, so again, similar themes to what we found with the HVOD, but we've got five themes now. Um, so it is, uh, again, important in terms of visualization, 3D understanding. A lot of the students identify that there were potential clinical applications for, for this kind of process. They felt that they got a deeper uh, and a more holistic understanding of the, the structures that they, these students, I should say, had actually learnt uh, the anatomy of the upper limb previously, but they felt that they actually got a better understanding of the structures from doing the workshop and certainly sort of solidified uh, their understanding. Um, they found it engaging. Um, they had some comments about how accessible it would be. Uh, whether it's possible to do it in person versus via Zoom. Uh, and again, similar to HVOD, there were some suggestions for how we could modify it, how we would integrate it into the sort of the packed curriculum that we have. So these are just some comments um, from uh, the students under each theme. And so you can see there, I'll not read them all out, but you can see that they, they do find it useful in terms of visualization. Um, especially if they're, they're doing a clinical ex examination um, and assessment, uh, they, could, they could kind of go back to their, their experience uh, to sort of help them to visualize the structures. Um, and you can see there for musculoskeletal, uh, and obviously we were doing the upper limb, so we were looking at a lot of musculoskeletal structures. They said that that was really useful. And again, they, 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 they saw that link there with, with clinical examination. And this was, these were some of the comments on the second theme. So again, they, this was a, uh, something that we, we found with HVOD as well, is that it does, um, it does support uh, a different way of thinking about anatomy. Uh, and we know that it's really important in anatomy is, is 
is sort of approaching it from different points of view can be really useful using a variety of approaches uh, in order to get a holistic understanding. Um, and you can see from those comments there that, uh, that this process has, has helped with that. So a lot of exploration, a lot of sort of deep uh, consolidation and understanding. Okay, so um, we, we find from these comments that the, the students really valued the support from Leonard during the workshop. Uh, they found that a small group was really useful um, and they found the discussions really useful. And this goes back again to the HVOD where we found that the social interaction was really important in that process as well. And so thinking forward to our MOOC, it's gonna be really important again that we support and we kind of try to recreate this approach and this these social interactions within a MOOC, um, which is, is going to be a challenge, but it's something that we're we're going to be working on. Okay, and again, engagement, um, and this is some uh, some comments here again going back to what Leonard said about uh, it's not about being artistic or having an artistic background. Uh, you don't have to have any of that to, to be able to engage and to benefit from this approach because really it's about observation rather than about art uh, which is really important in anatomy and uh, yeah they, they found it enjoyable they found it engaging which is uh, obviously going to be uh, important um, for them to to get anything out of the the process they're going to have to engage with it and again the, some of the mod modifications um, they, they felt like they might sort of need some sort of a, a prior introduction to the process, some prior un understanding of the anatomy. Perhaps, again, they did have that, but it, it was, you know, it, uh, in some cases, it had been quite some time since they'd done that. Um, and also, we didn't really focus too much on the, the names of the structures. It was more about just the observation and the identification of the structures. But if this is going to be uh, integrated into a curriculum, then obviously we're going to need to think about the, the named structures. Um, <clears throat> and even if it's sort of a, a supportive, optional, parallel course, which is our plan for the MOOC, we're still going to have to include some named structures in there to make it uh, entirely relevant. Okay, so uh, as Leonard said, we are developing this MOOC. Um, so we, again, we've done a pilot in Newcastle that we did in, uh, in October, and there's a, a pilot running in Cape Town at the moment. And the, the MOOC at the moment just involves some of the sort of a basic introduction. So the, the pilot is sort of an introduction to an understanding of 3D anatomy. So the idea is it's sort of aimed at any level um, but that's got to take into account novice students who've never done any anatomy before. Okay, and we've actually done this with uh, postgraduate courses as well, uh, and uh, who are actually um, using ultrasound. Um, and they actually found the, the course really useful for actually uh, visualizing structures in, in ultrasound. So essentially what we, this comparison here is that we're, we're showing the, the heart as a, as a lemon, uh, as a 3D structure, essentially. Um, and then we can continue that sort of analogy by, we use this activity actually physically, you know, cutting a lemon in half so that we can actually see, uh, you know, the different segments, which means that we obviously get a, a, a more detailed understanding of what's going on under the, the surface which is you know, what we see in the CT here of the heart. Okay, so we kind of use that analogy before we get into the anatomy and the details uh, of what they can see on a CT. Uh, it's just getting them to appreciate that, you know, if you, if you, even if you cut a, a lemon in a transverse versus a sagittal direction, then you're gonna get different information about what the inside of a, of a lemon actually looks like. And we can then compare that to what a CT would look like in a different plane. So again, we've, we've piloted that at the moment with these introductory um, activities using household objects. So obviously it's a remote process. We're trying to use objects that students are gonna have easy access to in their own houses. Um, and then the next stage of the MOOC that we're actually starting to film at the moment is to include the HVOD and then the HSP. 
So it should be a sort of a, a, a longitudinal course where you get the introduction, you get the HVOD and then the HSP. Uh, and this is something that students should be able to um, do in their own time, you know, just a couple of hours a week, maybe in parallel to their studies. And um, we'll build up that, that knowledge over uh, several weeks. Okay, so that's just to summarize. We've evaluated these two approaches, so HVOD and HSP. We found similar themes in terms of the advantages and the areas for development. Um, just again, emphasize HSP is distinct from traditional body painting. Uh, does focus again on holistic understanding, 3D visualization, um, rather than just thinking about surface reflections. Um, we've identified student and educator perceptions of these processes, and we're now going to integrate these processes into our MOOC. Okay, so I'd just like to thank everybody involved, uh, particularly Ella Hobbs, who actually did a lot of the, the, the work, the HSP work, the uh, setting up of the, the workshops, uh, running the focus groups and doing the analysis of the themes. So Ella was a, was a summer project student last summer who did a lot of that work. Okay, that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Keenan, for your presentation. Uh, really interesting. Um, I just want to uh, remind everyone that's tuned in to please put your questions for these two speakers into the chat box, and then we will um, get to that as we carry on. Uh, for now, we've got two questions which was um, sent in during uh, Leonard Shapiro's presentation, but I um, I want to encourage also Dr. Keenan to, to answer if, if he feels that he can contribute. So the first question was from Beverly Kramer, Kramer who wanted to um, know, um, how do we learn to draw 3D structures when we cannot touch the structures? For instance, to demonstrate embryological processes or histology. Does this just come from learning to draw structures we can touch? Okay, uh, yeah, I'll address that. Um, thanks, uh, Bev, Prof Kramer. Um, so actually, I can't remember her name now, but at UCT, I was called to do, uh, to, 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 to help students understand embryonic folding. And for that, we took uh, modeling clay, three layers of it, and then, you know, uh, use that to, to fold over. And then I added another step, which, which was to use their, their rulers to cut the modeling clay in half. So to, uh, to bisect it um, with, uh, along the sort of sagittal plane, as it were, I think, and, and then to observe what was inside. So there was a lot of haptics involved. There's a lot of touch involved in that. Um, then if we go to say histology, I remember the very first, uh, one of the first few workshops I did at UCT. In fact, uh, Dr. Jeannie Gunston was in that. Dr. Robio Bala was in that. Um, and we looked through um, the mics, the, mic the microscopes and at the slides and a challenge was presented as to how to understand this, uh, the relative sizes of the different um, cells, okay? And so I devised something for that, which was, you know, to really just draw, uh, touch and draw coins that we have, five cent coins, 10 cent coins, et cetera, to, and to, under, to, to get an understanding of relative size and then look through the microscope and, and draw what, what was there, and it did work. So essentially, Prof. Kramer, there, um, there are many ways to apply, say, art-based methods. And in the paper, the one paper that uh, Dr. Keenan showed us, which was about the 12 tips uh, for art-based methods, art-based techniques in anatomy education, um, in there, there are a number of techniques also that relate to 
uh, a number of different art-based me methods that can be applied um, to that. But definitely, Prof. Cromer, we'll, we, we, we can correspond as well offline. That would be great. The other question I think from someone was about, for me was about... Um, when the course will become available. Right, uh, that was from Francie Dorfling. Yes. So, so uh, Dr. Dorfling or, or Dorfling or Professor Dorfling, um, I'd be very happy to run a, to talk to you and run a workshop for yourself and your students. Um, so I've got your email address and I, I will be in touch. So uh, when will it become? Well, it's always available, but when will the MOOC become available? So that's, the MOOC, by the way, stands for Massive Open Online Course. It's basically when the course that we've designed between uh, uh, Newcastle and UCT, uh, when that becomes massive. In other words, when it goes global. <laughs> so that's, that's what that is. Um, uh, yeah, if that answers the question. But uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, so it's a, a Canvas-based course, which means that uh, the way that Canvas works is that you can actually add users to it, which is really good because our previous VLE, you weren't able to do that. Um, <clears throat> so at, at the moment, we're just coming up with a, a process um, where we kind of have a, a storefront, if you like, so people can actually come and sign in and use the course. But we're currently in the process of setting that up. So hopefully um, we will have it launched in October. So that's for the start of the academic year at Newcastle is the plan for our students. Um, and I would hope at the same time that we would make it available um, to others. So it, whether that would be you know, other institutions or whether it would be beyond that, we're not really sure of the details of that at the moment. Uh, we're hoping obviously because it's a, a MOOC to make it free, but there might be a small nominal charge that um, that we have to uh, you know we have to include uh, but we're hoping to avoid that if possible um, and yeah just come back to the other question as well about the um, sort of the, the touch so the part of the part of the MOOC itself so obviously because a lot of it is remote uh, what we're trying to do is to use these or encourage the participants to use these household objects um, so that they can actually use and palpate those. But obviously a lot of things like embryology, like histology, when it's not possible to, to palpate, uh, it's going to be a challenge. And I think they, they are sort of challenging areas of learning in any case. But we're not just focusing entire, entirely, although we know that there are advantages of uh, observation, visual observation and haptic observation and combining those. It's really important that, you know, some areas of anatomy, we can just use visual observation, uh, maybe using different tools, different approaches. Again, as I was saying earlier, really important for, for students to get a variety of different ways of looking at anatomy or embryology or histology. Um, ideally, they would use both visual and haptic, as I said, but, you know, some of them, they might be using a particular 3D app so for example at Newcastle we've got something called the, the Human uh, Developmental Biology Resource Atlas and that's actually has um, uh, human embryos digital representations of human embryos that can, you can actually, students can actually interact with um, so that's kind of a, one approach we've got another approach alongside that where we use interactive PDFs where students can rotate the embryos. And again, as Leonard was saying, something that we, we do as well is use sort of modeling clay as well to, uh, to demonstrate things like the, uh, what's really useful is, is demonstrating the heart tube and how it folds, um, because that's quite a, a complex situation as well as the, the folding of the embryo itself, the actual folding of the heart tube, uh, it can be really useful. So yeah, I hope that that kind of answers that. That question as well. Thank you. Thanks for both of you for answering those questions. I think it's very really interesting. Uh, just a question from myself. I don't see any other questions from the audience. Um, have you experienced, or do you think there will be a difference in the way um, the student or the participant in the course would interpret 
um, both the, the, the artwork type or the drawings or how they draw, if there is prior knowledge uh, about the object or does it not matter if they, if it's like a, a student that hasn't started with anatomy, with one that's busy with anatomy, with a, uh, somebody that's in post-grad studies, is there, a, is there any difference in the way they interpret this course? I mean, I, I would say that the, the course is intended for, for anyone, um, you know, as I mentioned before. And like I said, we, we, when we have used it with postgrad students who are actually, you know, again, uh, they're actually using ultrasound clinically um, in their, their current roles. They've got a lot out of it because it, even though they actually have done anatomy before and they're doing this on a daily basis, it does provide them with a different perspective and a different way of thinking about things. And a lot of the comments that we even had from the, those postgrads was that, oh, yeah, I never really thought of it like that or I'd never really considered of looking at it, at it in that way. For example, with the sort of the lemon exercise and cutting it in different planes and seeing it from different perspectives, then they found that really, you know, really effective even though, again, it was something that they'd done a lot of. Um, but, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> ideally, I get we, we want to, to get to the stage where a lot of students, when they are novices, are doing this, first of all, so that they have experienced uh, a course like this or had some sort of training, some sort of understanding in 3D spatial awareness when they start, ideally before they even start learning the names of anatomical structures. I think it's really important to get that spatial understanding. Yeah. So just to follow on from what Ian was saying, that like spatial awareness is actually a cognitive function. It really is a cognitive function. And um, I was once called to help radiation oncology planners to improve their, uh, their um, spatial awareness, fun spatial awareness ability, because, you know, they're looking at a flat screen and, to the extent that they understand then they were planning for radiation in the head and to the extent that they under they understand what the volume of the head is all about so what that understanding is in their mind okay is the extent to which they're able to plan better and they reported back to me that they were indeed able to to plan better knowing you know what the head is inside by using some of these exercises, including uh, observing with touch and, and drawing. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions. So I just want to say thank you again to both our guest speakers. It's a very interesting topic. I think um, I've learned a lot about maybe how to in interpret um, anatomy or how to teach students to interpret anatomy. Um, so thank you very much, uh, both Lynette and Ian for your presentations this morning. Thank you, Thank you. for having me. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you.